Welcome to American Issues Take One. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host, and today's title is Media's Influence of the 2024 Election. Uh, you know, we have about 40 days left before uh, people count their votes and we decide who the next president's going to be. And in those 40 days, we see the media working very hard to cover the two presidential candidates, Donald Trump and Vice President Kamala Harris. Uh, back in the day, reporters would say, hey, reporting is fair and balanced. Uh, back in the day, decades ago, you would see maybe a news anchor at, at, uh, on a desk, and he would simply go down bullet format of the facts, what the facts of the news were for that day. And then, lo and behold, uh, after the commercial break, you would see another desk with another chair. And above it, maybe by a clock or just on the wall, it would say editorial. And they would pan to someone sitting in that desk. And that individual would give an editorial uh, maybe for a few minutes. And that was the end of the news show. Uh, today, we see a blurring of sorts. We see facts being portrayed in, in, in the, you know, as far as news of the day. But we also then have uh, an anchor host that somehow filters some of that information or those facts through editorial or uh, opinion. And that seems to be the state of the condition of a lot of our media today. Uh, there are some news outlets that are trying their best to go back to the old days of just bullet format uh, reporting of the news. But those stations or those news media outlets are few and far between. Uh, back in 2002, uh, there was a journalist by the name of Tom Jones for the Columbia Journal Review that said uh, an interesting definition of objectivity. And that would be that the um, objectivity would be reported as seeing the world as it is, not as you wish it to be. So in the next 40 days, uh, it's my hope that objectivity will, will rue the day. And to discuss how the media covers the 2024 election, I have with me a special esteemed guest, Julian Gorbeck, Associate Professor of Journalism in the School of Communication at University of Hawaii, Manoa. And of course, as always, my trusty co-host, Jay Fidel. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. Good morning, morning Tim. Hey, Jay, I'm, before I start, I was going to go down a list of some points that a journalist, a former journalist of CNN, he was a senior media reporter by the name of Oliver Darcy. And uh, he is now branched off. He, he's left CNN and he's branched off into his own, uh, if you will, newsletter. I think it's called Status. And what he did is he po pointed out four things as far as kind of what the media is up to when it comes to reporting on political candidates. But before I do that, I just noticed this morning that uh, former Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, took issue with some political reporting. And that was, uh, she was being interviewed by Jake Tapper, CNN News. And uh, basically they played a clip of Donald Trump uh, chastising Kamala Harris, saying that uh, she's a bigger, uh, has a bigger chaos, is a bigger problem, has uh, more cognitive problems than Joe Biden. And no sooner was that clip played that Nancy Pelosi said, in a rather harsh term to Jake Tapper, why would you cover something like that? And she further said, let's talk about the silliness of it all, the weakness of it all, the assault of women of it all. And why would you cover that? So her point is well founded. Uh, we have the media covering both candidates uh, in a variety of ways. And the question is, is the coverage fair and balanced and objective when it comes to the two candidates in this election season? You know, I think we have to take a fresh look at this, you know, we have been saying here on this show and its predecessors that it's important to distinguish between fact and opinion, between fact and analysis, they often call it these days, between fact and editorial board statements. <clears throat> but you know what? We're in a five alarm fire. Um, the, the country is at great risk. If, if uh, Trump is elected, we will we will have a change and it will affect every man, woman, and child on the planet. Um, and it, I don't think it takes a genius to know that. Um, it's what he's promised. It's what, what is in his 2025, you know, memo. Um, and it's it's him. It's him. It's every aspect of him. Uh, I don't want to go into the details. It's just to say that he's crazy. And he is threatening to undo everything this country stands for, and thus the, the liberal world order. 
<clears throat> so I see, you know, them talking about music and art. I see them talking about the latest recipes and how you can live a better life at home. I see all this and I say, this is really not important. What's important is saving the country and the world and our lives. But I don't think, and I read the Washington Post and I read the New York Times, I, I don't think they agree with me. You may not agree with me. I don't want to see anything but what saves us. We are in a war. I don't understand why the press doesn't see it that way. So there, there's coverage, as you said. What are you going to cover? Um, you're going to cover what Trump says on a given morning, you know, what he had for breakfast. Uh, I remember these, uh, quote, news conferences, end quote, where nobody was able to ask him a question. He just made a speech and criticized his opponent and called everyone names. I mean, that's not news. That's not news. It was never news. And yet they cover it. I don't know why. Maybe Julian knows why. Um, but the problem is, first, it's coverage. Second, it's placement. And Julian can speak to this, too. <clears throat> What's on the top? What's on, on the right-hand side? What's on the left-hand side? What do you cover first? Um, it's very important because people don't read the whole paper. They look at the headlines. They look at the right or the left. And you have a big effect on their thought process and public opinion um, by where you place it. And finally, is the thing about, you know, fact and opinion. It's the thing about, um, quote, balanced reporting. Um, I, I think the press is living in the time of Clark Kent and Perry White and this hypothetical press. And it ain't like it was. It ain't like it was. Even that new that that movie I mentioned before the show began, Michael Keaton in the the paper in 1994 about you know journalistic ethics. Um, <clears throat> and there have been many movies about that. But life has changed, and Trump knows how to play the media. You can quote me. He plays the media every day, and the media sucks in. So what we have is a whole bunch of, um, you know, phenomena uh, where the media is not telling us that we're in a five alarm fire um, when he does outrageous things, make outrageous statements, you know, um, you know, eating dogs and cats and <clears throat> and uh, uh, killing children after they're born. And Kamala Harris has, uh, you know. Uh, thought problems and all the he blames her for all the things that he is and worse and the media reports it like it's fact like, oh yeah that's what he said yeah that's what he said <clears throat> i don't care i don't want to hear that and i want the media to put the brakes on that sort of thing right. you don't report crap and they have been reporting crap to us for as long as trump has been around i don't think they're doing us any favors Okay, well, let me go to Julian about the, the these four points of what you just described. Um, Julian, uh, former uh, CNN reporter um, Oliver Darcy uh, outlined four four reasons why the media may not be as effective as they used to be, and uh, particularly when it comes to reporting uh, with Donald on Donald Trump. And the first point is that he said uh, traditional media uh, has a hard time calling out bizarre candidate behavior. Um, I think it was the first time that the New York Times, September 17th, 2016, was able to print that Donald Trump was a liar. Uh, that was a, a, a moment in journalistic history that really journalists never did before. Uh, but they have a hard time taking a, a traditional format of interviewing and, and coverage and applying it to someone who has rather strange, bizarre uh, behavior as some of these yeah. candidates have. Okay. Covering unusual stuff is what's called man bites dog stories. It's actually, to a fault, a specialty of a press, and if anything, uh, an excess of the press. You know, the idea of man bites dog is if a dog bites a man, it's not unusual. If a man bites a dog, that's unusual. The press has a penchant, a, a, you know, it sees it's like a magnet to man bites dog stories. The problem with Trump is he's man bites dog every day. And the thing that press, press critics have pointed out is that we've gotten to the point where we're numb to it. Where now when he says really bizarre, crazy things that make us say, hey, that's crazy, we no longer see it as crazy because with Trump, nine years of Trump, crazy has become normal. So that's my response to point number one. Point number okay. two. 
Well, let's go to point number two. But before I do, yeah, the uh, the term, the new normal, uh, was coined somewhere around 2017, 2016, just as as he became president. Uh, excellent points, and I follow up later on about how we combat being desensitized. Certainly, uh, not only the journalists but also the general public. Uh, point number two is. Uh, reporters are concerned that if they ask too hard of questions or make Trump look too bad with their questioning, that they may not be allowed in the room at uh, his press conferences. And every media company, of course, needs to get access. And if they're barred from Donald Trump or his staff, um, they're kind of out of business for a while. So that uh, it is often said that Trump is handled with kid gloves when it comes to a hard news conference. And uh, do you have any comment on that? Yeah. Um, first thing I want to say is that one thing that that could kind of lead to a pitfall here, some confusion, is that when we talk about what shows up on a website um, on the New York Times page, we might almost call that print media, although it's not anymore. You know, the New York Times web page is, is their web page. But there's a difference between that and a live interview. So we're talking about live interview exchanges when you ask your question, right? And what I'd say is that... Um, you know, I think journalists have been struggling for nine years and continue to struggle with with finding a playbook for how to deal with the live interview. I mean, we have had uh, we've had kind of one spectacular recent example to learn from after another recently. Like there was the National Association of Black Journalists. Mm -hmm. And if you folks remember the first question out of the gate to Trump and his response to it, we look uh you know, another one was Dana Bash interviewed uh, J.D. Vance and was rapidly trying to fact check him over and over. One of the, uh, uh, you know, if we want to talk about effective strategies for maybe how to not be kind of just completely pliant and to be aggressive, I think journalists, they're, they're ones who are better than others, but I think there are some, some lessons to be learned. George Stephanopoulos and Mehdi Hassan have kind of specialized in if a, if a person being interviewed is dodging the question. Like, you know, uh, if, if George Stephanopoulos, and he, and he did this over the spring and summer with several interviews, where he'd say, uh, do you believe the 2020 election was uh, legitimate? And he would be interviewing Senator Tim Scott uh, or an, another figure, and they would dodge and they would weave and they would, you know, give a half answer or they would say, you know, look at the squirrel over here to try and distract and, and pivot to another thing. Um, what what Stephanopoulos did was he would stay on the same question and ask it over and over and over again until he got uh, either a direct answer or until it became clear that the, that the that the person who was giving dishonest answers was just embarrassing themselves. And sometimes it took nine minutes of repeating the same question to do that. But but a lot of the trick is to like at the at the moderator uh, in the last Harris Trump debate. There was a very loaded question that that just everybody seemed to have missed, which was so important to be asked. And it was the first time I've heard it asked of Trump, which was you're talking about deporting anywhere between 10 to 20 million people. Can you explain the train system that you're going to build for that, sir? Can you describe the, the camps that you're going to build, the train systems and the camps? for your 10 to 20 million people that you are going to round up. And you know what Trump did with that? He said, well, I have two minutes, so I'm going to pivot and I'm going to talk about what I want to talk about and I hope I never have to sit down in another interview with like George Stephanopoulos or something else where the interviewer decides to spend nine minutes asking me over and over again to ask the, answer that. Okay, question. let's go to that debate, the, the Trump-Harris debate. ABC was the uh, media company that had the moderators. And after the debate, well, first off, they both did instant fact-checking. Fact uh, I thought they did a great job in instant fact-checking. Uh, some of the things about, you know, if in fact, patients in Springfield, Ohio, were eating cats, dogs, and pets. Two is, are they really killing uh, newborn babies after birth, uh, killing them right then and there? Are they really performing uh, nine-month abortions uh, frequently? And so these things were challenged to Donald Trump, and I suppose he didn't like it. Uh, in fact, I know he didn't like it because soon after he accused uh, both moderators, uh, David Muir and um, Lindsay. Yes. Thank you. And uh, he they, he accused them of being um, they were set up. 
they were being set up and they were they were the attack dogs for the Democrat liberals. Well, and, uh, you know, the question is, uh, is it appropriate for a moderator to ask follow up questions right then and there? Uh, I've listened to other people who have been past moderators for debates and they said, no, it's not my job. It's my job is to ask the question and get the answer. Um, I think of the society of professional journalism, the first tenet of that, and that is seek the truth. And if someone's lying in front of you right then and there, uh, don't you have the obligation to your audience to follow up, fact check as best you can? Julian, your thought on that? Now might be a good time for me to insert the, just the more broader comment that as, as a public, you know, as a, as a society and, and, you know, within the field of journalism, we all might just benefit a little bit by just admitting up front that we have proven ourselves to be terrible philosophers. We are not dealing with a lot of these concepts that we introduce and throw around competently. OK, objectivity is a very unsound philosophy. It's very poorly understood. It's very abused. It's thrown around in a lot of ways. And even if we take the kind of probably most traditional, conventional definition we can offer for it, it is a completely incoherent philosophical. OK, concept. all right. Okay. Let's start with that. And with the debate thing, it's the same thing. We want to talk about debates, but we have no idea what the role of the moderator should be. And when people have been tossing out, like kind of pulling out of their butts, what a moderator should be, it's like the first thing that occurred, you can tell when you listen to the commentary about the debates, they've thought about it for about two minutes, right? And you're, so you're getting terrible ideas of what that job should be. Uh, uh, the most recent one that I heard was that the moderator is a fill-in for the public. And that the, that the, de, you know, that the debaters, each debater, it's their job to fact check. And the moderator is just to be there to facilitate the concept. Okay, that's a great idea if you've had 10 seconds to think about it. But why don't we come up with another one? And I'm not just saying, I'm not saying this is the absolute one that we have to go with. But if the debate is a competition, because the election is a competition in which we're going to have a winner and a loser, then that suggests that there should be some fair play. And in a competition, there's a role for a referee. And so when you have a debate, because it's for an election where there's definitely going to be a winner and loser, there's probably going to need to be a winner and loser to that debate. We should maybe, it would be helpful to think that maybe there could be or should be, in which case it's important to have a referee who makes sure both sides are, relatively speaking, playing within the rules. In that sense, I think fact-checking is essential because if one guy decides to cheat, a good way for that person to cheat is to be hitting foul balls all over the place by just flooding the zone with, with you know what, mm -hmm. as Steve Bannon said, and and just or you know now there's a, there's a, this other strange words for it, but it's basically when you spew out as many lies as you can of all different genus of lies as you can as fast as possible. I'm glad to hear you say that fact checking is and should be performed during a debate, and I couldn't agree with you more. Um, let me go to Jay on something here, Jay. I want to hit the other two points uh, that all, Oliver Darcy pointed out and uh, the challenges that presents to media. Before you do that, Tim, I just want to add something to, or at least ex explain my reaction to Julian's thing about fact-checking. You know, <clears throat> Trump was complaining that this this whole debate was, uh, what, three-on-one or something? Yes. Uh, and, and, uh, that, and that was interesting, but, you know, it should be another person in the room uh, when I was a kid and we wanted to settle some factual issue, we would call the New York Times. The number was Lackawanna 4 1000. And you could call and get a very smart guy on the other end. When I was a kid, um, I remember some things like that. Very smart guy on the other end. And he would answer your question. It was like it was like Google. Um, OK, so you could have, you know, the debaters, fine. And then, um, you know, the moderator says, well, what do you think, Lackawanna 4 or 1000? What do you think, You're the, the fact check man who is online? Does that sound true to you? Any comment? Now, he may not be able to answer, but sometimes he can identify that it's crap and he should say that. And it's real time. And it's those people in, in the red states who listen to the first imprimatur and they say, hmm, that's what Trump said. It must be true. And if you criticize it later, it's too late. 
you've you've already affected public opinion with with the lie. So I'm I'm thinking that what you're really talking about, Julian, at least to me, is another person essentially in the room, in the debate room, uh, right. where the moderators say, "Hey, um, what what is the truth on this? Is that true? What are your reactions on that?" And right. I think that would be a real good em enhancement of the debate process. Can I just respond real quickly to that, Tim? Of course. Yeah, I, you, you're 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 getting it. You know, that's what I was getting at exactly. Thank you, Jay, for filling that in. Because, like, you know, to to give so I use the example of a referee. You wouldn't have the other team calling the rules in the middle of a sports game, right? But by the same token, when you're in a court proceeding, you know, if you're involved in the case, you don't sit there and do what your attorney does. You know, uh, when you go into court and you're involved in a court case, you may get called as a witness in the situation in which you're either a plaintiff or a defendant, right? And so then you can't jump out of the witness stand and play attorney and argue the case. That's why you have an attorney as a separate person, because that person has credibility that because you're in the middle of it, you don't have. So that's, yes, that's why you need a fact checker, why you need, or, a, you know, to use the other analogy, a, a referee in a, in a contest. Well, I, I've noticed that in the last year or so, um, CNN and other news media agencies have hired a fact checker. It's only after the the debate is over or the um, over the uh, town hall meeting is over. Um, I like the idea right then and there, as live as possible, uh, to call any candidate out on a known lie or um, an attempted lie. So, good point, Julian. And, and Jay, thank you for bringing that up. Uh, let me go back to uh, the third point from Oliver, Oliver Darcy. And that is uh, journalists seem to be struggling a bit because the corporate boards that own the media outlets, um, by definition, have an influence. There's supposed to be a firewall between uh, you know the reporters and, and owners of the company, but uh, sometimes that firewall is disintegrated or there's certainly big holes in the firewall. Uh, do you think that's a, a fair, Jay, do you think that's a fair assessment that uh, Darcy is pointing out about uh, Rupert Mur Murdoch and his kids and or even in Disney or uh, even Jeff Bezos? You know, to what degree does senior management uh, agree with a particular politician or or a party and, and, and by that definition influence how the reporters are covering the story? They will always deny that they affect um, editorial policy. They will always, the owners will always deny it. The board of directors will always deny it. Senior management will always deny it. But I'm not convinced. I don't know if you guys are convinced. Well, and I'm I not. think that in these days, you really have to ask yourself that question. What is going on here? Who is affecting what? I mean, you know, for example, that Fox News is up and down from the top to the bottom. Um, and it's all controlled by senior management and, and stockholders. I mean, if they making money, if they have eyeballs and advertisers, that's good. If they don't have eyeballs and advertisers, that's bad. This is going to affect their editorial policy. I'm sorry. You'll never convince me otherwise. That's one aspect of it. The other is, the other is and, I, and I'm very interested to see how you guys react to this. Two weeks ago, there was an essay in the Washington Post by A.G. Sulzberger, A.G. Sulzberger is the publisher of the New York Times, but it did not appear in the New York Times. And the proposition that he covered in this essay was that Trump was not fit to be president. Heavy duty. OK, <clears throat> why the Washington Post? Why not the Times? What is going on here? Are people able to speak their minds in a newspaper that they publish? Maybe they're withholding, you know, their views in the newspaper that they publish. We address that, and and it was to make a stronger statement, Jay. It was to say we're gonna we're gonna join hands with the Washington Post. This is the New York Times and the Washington Post uniting in warning about Donald Trump as a threat to the free press. That was the point of doing it in the Washington Post. He said so. Yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you for mentioning that. So what you know what I'm saying is I I I think you have to look at all the facts and circumstances in our in our democratic and uh, capital concentration society. And you have to figure out just exactly what the agenda is. And you always have to go in there knowing there must be some agenda. It's never pure. 
You can go to Columbia Journalism School all day long. You can go to UH Journalism School all day long, but there must be an agenda. And the question is to figure out what that agenda is and to identify it. So um, I'm not I'm not convinced that this is pure. I'm not convinced that uh, somebody isn't trying to sell you something. You know, a couple of shows ago, Tim, you you asked the question: Is um, are, are the media uh, kingmakers? And the answer, I don't remember if everybody was unanimous on that, but my answer was yes, they are kingmakers. I could take popular media, media that is, uh, you know, influential, and I could, you know, subtly repeat a message about what candidate is better. Uh, I think they, a lot of them have stopped making endorsements, but uh, you can make an endorsement implicitly without making it obvious. Um, and and I think th that ultimately, through the course of an election, a campaign that lasts for years, uh, the media is a kingmaker. Certain media will make some kings, other media will make other kings, but there's always an agenda on that, whether it's stated or not. And I'd be interested in your views of that, Julian. Well, I mean, I guess the original question was about corporate ownership and its you know, influence on, on the shape of the coverage. I, I would say you know, that, that when people have a cultural background and a socioeconomic background, I, you know, maybe another way to look at it is less like somebody plotting some, uh, you know, profit margin they plan to have and how they're going to get there. And more that, you know, these guys have a worldview that they carry with them when they're sending their kids to private school and, to you know, uh, colleges that now cost eighty to $100,000 a year and everything else. There's a certain worldview you have. And if we're going to give ourselves any credit, Let's just think back about a minute or two ago. We were all agreeing that the media has no idea what the job of the moderator should be in presidential debates, not even a basic fundamental idea of what job that person is performing. Should they do fact checking or not? And if so, why? Right. Uh, so if you think about it, there's a lot of just fundamental fuzziness about what the job of these, you know, reporters and the editors and everybody down the line should be doing. And we could say, oh, that's because there's this very clear agenda that these very wealthy corporate owners have for where it should be going. Or we could just say what I sort of said uh, a, a couple minutes ago, which is that collectively, we are just like terrible philosophers. A lot of the fundamental ideas here are very fuzzy. They're poorly worked out. There's a real lack of clarity about what the job of a reporter should be, what the what the principal responsibilities of the press should be right now. And and so it's it would be easy to say, oh, this is all because of corporate greed. But when nobody seems to know what we're talking about and what we're doing, I just think it's a bigger problem. Let me add a couple of points to what you're saying. Yeah. I, I wrote for the uh, uh, Honolulu Advertiser and the Star Advertiser for eight years. I wrote a column. And uh, I never got a headline through once, not once, not one single time in all that time. I could write headlines, I could suggest headlines, but my headlines were never, ever, ever accepted. And presumably I knew what I was saying in the, in the column, but they didn't accept my headlines. <clears throat> they always had an angle on it. And I suggest to you, you may know more about this, but I suggest to you, that's always the way it is. You can write an article, but somebody is in charge of the headline. And the headline is what a lot of people read and, and abide by. My experience was the opposite, Jay. I mean, I, you know, I worked for local papers for about a decade. And more often than not, I, I was like in control of everything from what I chose to cover to how I wrote it to the, you know, there would be somebody who would look at it really quick before it hit the press. But when I was putting out daily stuff, and that's why I'm like less conspiratorial minded about it. But also... We weren't wrestling with with questions of objectivity. I mean, we were back then and we had very fuzzy answers back then, but we weren't wrestling with it in the way the national. Uh, that's the most profound point so far. This is not the same as it was. It is not the same when I wrote that column. It is not the same when you worked for the, these newspapers across the country. It is different now. Trump has changed that. And the way the press reacts to Trump has changed that. Now, one of the things you were getting at before, Tim, and I, I think it's worth mentioning, is access. 
So if I'm if I'm uh, somebody who appears uh, in the, the uh, press conference room of the White House and I ask a question that embarrasses the candidate like like Trump, A, he won't answer it. And B, he'll say, that's it for you. C, he'll 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 insult me and my newspaper uh, and I won't be able to get back in there. Now, now, this may not be a perfect defense uh, through his first administration, but it's very clear what's going to happen if he wins. If he wins, I won't have any access at all. OK, therefore, I have to be careful now not to run him down too badly because I want that access. My paper's success and profitability depends on that access. If he closes me out, I suffer, my paper suffers. So I don't want that to happen. I try to find ways to soften my question, not to repeat it uh, for nine minutes, uh, and generally not to offend him. This is where it's going, isn't it? Well, let me give an example. Um, you know, there's a lot of pressure for these reporters to get access. And, you know, I'm looking at the former CEO of CNN, uh, Chris Leitch or Lech. Uh, he was shown the door recently um, because he's just very unpopular. And uh, he basically sponsored Trump on that town hall meeting with uh, uh, Caitlin, Caitlin Collins. And after that, I mean, it took a lot of heat for allowing Donald Trump the microphone for an hour plus. And a lot of heat. I mean, he was in his Donald Trump mode, and she did her best to try to corral him. He called her nasty and walked all over her. Um, at the end of the performance, and that's what he called it, he goes, a masterful performance. Clear support for Donald Trump's per performance in that town hall meeting. Uh, totally inappropriate. And then he said to the, the, the journalists, uh, if you don't like the former president's answers, you can say that you, you did actually get to them. You don't have to like them, but you actually got an answer out of the uh, President Trump. And I, I guess that's that's the point that uh, that Oliver Darcy was trying to make is uh, this kind of influence, particularly in CNN and the CEO of CNN, should not be weighing in on such matters. But yet there he did. And I guess maybe that's one of the reasons he's no longer CEO. Uh, Jay, your thought about that kind of influence. It's there. And Trump has... Trump has become a past master in dealing with that and parlaying that. And I, you know, I think once the once the genie is out of the bottle, there'll be other politicians who'll do the same thing. I mean, he he was ruthless in excluding people from his press conferences. And he will be all the more ruthless. And that's the way he controls the press. He's always wanted to do that. Now we live in a world of propaganda. We live in a world of misinformation and disinformation. We live in a world of manipulating the press. And the press hasn't figured out how to deal with it. They haven't figured out how to deal with Trump. They haven't figured out how to deal with these new tricks that Trump has shown shown the way for. Nine years to get to, to learn the curve. Um, I would just say, I mean, we're one of the problems where, you know, to get back to this idea that a lot of our ideas are not very coherent, a lot of our definitions, ideas of the roles of the press, is that a lot of this gets complicated, right? Like, Jay, you brought up access. Then we started talking about, you know, the way Trump is able to, to manipulate an event, whether it's a press conference or a town hall with Caitlin Collins, right? These are separate and apart from something that we kind of began with, which was this question of objectivity, which I said was a sound idea. So, I mean, but again, I just want to get at a root of something here and maybe why nine years later we're no further along, which is like, if, you know, the idea of objectivity, the original, what we, you know, geeky academics would call naive empiricism, like the pure original old school objectivity of say 1910 to 1920, was the idea that you you separate it's the, the objectivity is just the facts, right? And there's no bias, and that you separate just the facts from opinion, from interpretation, and from ethics. All right. Now, does anyone really want journalism that is just pure Julian facts, like a laundry list? Well, you know, for example, Julian, there was there's an uh, there's an ad that Trump is publishing um, about uh, how um, Kamala Harris is uh, she's got uh, sex sex change operations going on, and the government is paying for it. 
uh, for people who were incarcerated. I mean, that is a crock, a complete crock. And yet he repeats it and he goes to these rallies or whatever kinds of uh, hey, gatherings there are and he repeats it and people buy it because there's nobody there at the rally there's there's no there's no ombudsman there at the rally who t is saying this wrong so you know and and then the press and this is the part that troubles me and then the press reports it they actually report that he said that um okay, and, I, they, and they don't necessarily say that this is a huge crock and this is where I really get off the trolley, because because they should not report that at all. They should not give him any oxygen for bullshit like that. Yeah. And okay. yet they do almost every day. Julian, go ahead and respond. We're going to wrap up here pretty quick. Go ahead and respond to that point Jay just okay. made. So the, the, well, the reason I keep talking about philosophy with this, Jay, is you raise a, a, a legitimate question about what I pointed out about our idea of objectivity. And like a, a guy named Michael Shetson made a very good point about facts. Some facts are just facts, okay? I know I'm, I'm born. We all know we're born. We all know we die. We all know our way home to work and, and you know, uh, from home to work and back, right? Some facts only have meaning within a web of interpretation, right? If, if, if you know, Trump says the election was rigged, you can't just fact check that with like one simple thing, because then he's going to twist it around and say, what about what about this? What about that? What about that? So, you know, facts is a big umbrella word for a lot of different things. And what I would suggest to you is we do not want objective reporting that's independent or completely isolated from our basic ethical absolutes about right and wrong. We do not want journalists who have who are completely amoral and where everything goes. We had an abolitionist press. You know, I'm teaching media history right now. And I say to the students, oh, okay, do you call that biased, a biased newspaper? Because, you know, in the early 19th century, they crusaded against slavery. Isn't that something we would want in journalism? But that's a bias, right? That's not objective. That's anti-slavery, which is not a crazy position to have, but it is a moral position. So there's a lot of complexity that the word objectivity just completely misses. And I and, and the point I'm making with all this, Tim, is that we've had a hundred years, not just nine years, we've had a hundred years to come up with alternative, an alternative just simple list of rules to tell a journalist, this is what your job is. And we've never come up with an alternative rule book other than be objective, be unbiased, be morally neutral about everything, apparently, right? Um, everything is just a simple fact, like the, you know, the examples that, that, that Jay brought up, and nothing is going to involve some interpretation and context. And, and that just doesn't work. And so we need better job definitions, job descriptions for what a good reporter is. I think what you just said really uh, highlights perfectly that award they give out every year to journalists, and that's the Edwin R. Murrell Award where he wasn't just completely objective, he had to take on Joseph McCarthy for the sake of the country. And um, so there it is, um, you're objective, but when there's a known quantity, and I'll say in this case, in the 2024 election, the known quantity is Donald Trump, um, I'd like to see some more objective and also just hard truth telling about who this character is that wants to be our president again. So, um, we're going to wrap up. I'm going to give you one last question, Julian. I appreciate you coming on the show. Uh, you're working with students. And I guess my question is this. How are your students viewing the media coverage of this 2024 election? Uh, I mean, I just feel like, I don't know. I, it, it becomes a generalization. And I, I, I'm not sure how it bears with the data. But it seems to me I, I am always surprised by the degree to which they see Trump as normal. Um, and if I if I were to get into class and I were to start talking about the cats and dogs issue um, or something else, they very quickly get annoyed. I asked my journalism history students a couple of weeks ago, are any of you concerned about democracy being online in the 20, you know, in the, in the upcoming election? And out of 20 students, to raise their hand that they were concerned about democracy being on the line. So, you know, I think a lot of them uh, consider it, um, they're not following the news. If they're getting any news, they're getting it on social media. And Trump to them is a normal president. 
Wow. And, you know, they're very fired up about racism and sexism and stuff like that, but not when it comes out of his mouth. When it comes out of his mouth, they don't seem to hear it. Is it desensitized? Are they desensitized? Intensely. Okay. In my in my day to day experience with students on the UH campus, that's an eye opener answer. And um, I, we've run out of time, so uh, Julian, I'm going to ask for your last thoughts on this topic, and then to you, Jay. My last thoughts are that um, I I would like to see us come up with um, a better rule book for journalists, um, either different ways that might work. I mean, I've spent a lot of the last several years studying the way that journalists of the 30s responded to Mussolini, Hitler, and Stalin to see if they came up with a rule book that was alternative to the classic old school objectivity. But there's also people like the journalistic ethicist Stephen Ward who suggested something called pragmatic objectivity. There, In other words, there are people that are working on Let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Let's find a 21st century conception of objectivity that makes sense now that we've had 100 years to learn lessons about what the naive version of objectivity is. And we need to start having a real conversation about that. It needs to be more than just on a public access channel while the bulwark and MSNBC and whatever get nowhere with these basic concepts. Like, how, good God, can't they have somebody on to talk, you know, to have some real talk about this? It just okay. it's gotten so repetitive on them. The, the quality of the punditry is really frustrating. Julian, thank you for your last thoughts on that. Jay, you get the last word. I just want to say that part, part of making better journalists is to educate them in things beyond journalism itself. Um, if you don't understand what democracy is, then you're you're not going to be ready to deal with the candidate who wants to destroy democracy. Uh, so the two out of 20 is very concerning to me. And somebody ought to put them in a, a clockwork orange kind of setting where they <laughs> <laughs> where they learn about American history and they learn about democracy and they they learn about the liberal world order. If they don't know those things, they can't. Do it. I remember going to a, an event involving the fall of the Bishop Estate back when, years ago, and sitting next to a reporter from the Honolulu Advertiser, and she was copiously taking notes, and I was right there at the same event. And then the following day, there was a news story that appeared, you know, at a priority uh, part of the newspaper, and it was all wrong, all wrong. She didn't have a clue about what was going on. So, you know, if, if they graduate maybe with a four year degree or not and they get a job, you know, I don't know how the, the market is these days. They get a job doing, quote, journalism. They may not be up to the game. They need to know more if if they are to realize the promise of journalism. We expect to be educated. A lot of us stop at the sixth grade or the 12th grade. We have no idea. We, we are not educated except, except by journalism after that time. So we trust them. They must be worthy of the trust. The second part that I want to mention, just in case you guys forgot, is it's really late now. It's 40 days before an election that is likely to change our lives. It's 40 days of a five alarm fire in so many places, not only the US, but in Europe and in, in the Middle East, and for that matter, in Asia Pacific. Um, and we really have needed better journalism all this time. And, you know, I don't think we're fully informed or activated uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a public electorate, you know, to deal with these issues. And and that may be a you know, sort of pessimistic way to look at it, but the truth is it's a five alarm fire. And if we're using old systems and old concepts in, in the media to deal with a fire alarm fi five alarm fire, um, it's not gonna work well. That's all I have. All righty. We've run out of time, so I'd like to thank our special esteemed guest, Julian Gorbeck, Associate Professor of Journalism at University of Hawaii, Manoa. And to always, my co-host, Jay Fidel. Won't you join us next week for American Issues Take One? I'm Tim Apicelli, your host. And until then, aloha. <laughs>